Before we jump in, I just want to say how much I appreciate you guys. Uh, yesterday we had a membership class for people interested in Southside, and so it's basically three hours of talking about us and talking about y'all and talking about what we do and why we do what we do and how we do what we do, and I'm just, I just, I'm just proud to be your pastor. I'm so thankful. I'm encouraged by your faith in Christ. I'm encouraged by your love for God's word. I'm encouraged by your love for one another, and I just want to tell you that. I'm encouraged by God's work in your life. As we continue our series, Questioning Christianity, I mentioned that two of our sermons would be a bit more academic. And we don't do this often, but I think it's good to do it on occasions. The first one, if you weren't here, was the sermon on science and how evolution fails terribly as a worldview. And this morning we come to our second one that'll be a little more academic, a little more philosophical, and that is the problem of evil. And so the plan this morning is we'll look at the problem, and then we'll look at some proposed solutions and then we'll look at the problem of evil for atheists. And the next week, I want to spend a little more time digging in to the unique resources that the Christian faith provides us to endure suffering. So this week, a little more heady. Next week, a little more pastoral. So first, let's think about the problem. And it is a problem. And I kind of want you to feel that. We may not think about it much, but it is a problem. Some have called it the Achilles heel of the Christian faith, the problem of evil. And most basically it goes like this. If God is good and God is powerful, why is there suffering and evil in the world? The Bible does say that God is all powerful. It does say that God is all good. If God is all powerful, why can't he stop evil? And if God is all good, why would he not want to? Either he's not all powerful or he's not all good, or evil would not exist. But evil does exist, therefore they say God does not exist, at least not one who's all good and all powerful. Here's how one atheist philosopher put it several, year, several hundred years ago, or not several hundred, a couple hundred years ago, David Hume said this, he said, is God willing to prevent evil but not able? Then he is impotent, powerless. Is he able but not willing? Then he is malevolent, wicked himself. Is he both able and willing? Whence then is evil? And that's a logical problem, but it's also experiential, right? For every person in here, and if not now, soon, the question will be why? It's a logical problem. It's an experiential problem. What I want to say first is that it's not just a problem for Christians. Every person, every religion, every worldview must handle this issue of evil. Here's just a way some of the major religions try to handle it. Buddhists... They try to transcend it through detachments. They see evil as an illusion. There's others that see it this way as well. Christian science, the, the cult of Christian science also sees evil as merely an illusion. But that doesn't really solve the problem, right? We could really just back up the objection. Okay, maybe there's not such a thing as evil. Well, why does God allow such a terrible illusion of pain? Because it is painful. Islam says various things, but mostly they say we must overcome it by submitting to Allah who causes it, and we need to try to dis detach ourselves from its effects. Hindus have, you know, thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of gods, and most of them teach that suffering is just karma. Your karma ran over my dogma. <laughs> that line has nothing to do with this sermon. I've just always wanted to say that. <laughs> The idea is, though, you can't interfere. You can't interfere with evil because what goes around comes around. You reap what you sow. And if so, you try to help somebody. For example, if you try to help the poor, that's actually discouraged within Hinduism because you're helping them out. And if you help them out, they're going to have to pay for that in the next life. So just let them suffer. Let them run its course. And in the next go around, in the next reincarnation, things will be better for them. New Age thinkers say that evil and all negative reality can be overcome by positive thinking. And some of this stuff ends up in some Christian visions of thinking as well, but it just fails to satisfy. And so the question we need to ask is which view of the world, which worldview best accounts for the problem of evil? And there's actually several Christian responses, several Christian proposals. So how do various Christians tackle this problem? Well, there's, again, not just one, but probably the most popular is one called the free will defense. And it goes like this, God has given people free will, so God had nothing to do with it, and so he's off the hook. They say that our choices, the choices of people, are in no way foreordained or caused by God. Now, we have to get a little bit philosophical here for a moment. 
the whole view of free will defense is based upon a certain view of human freedom. It's known as libertarianism, not the political kind, but it's called libertarian free will. And it goes like this. It says that and they insist that an action is free if there is nothing that decisively inclines the will in one direction or the other. No outside compulsion whatsoever. Even your own character can't be something that compulses you to go one way or the other. You must be completely free in order to be truly free according to this view. I've said before a couple of times, especially with Jonah, that the Bible holds forth a different view of freedom. One, again, philosophically called compatibilism for my fellow nerds in the room. And the idea is that God's sovereignty and human choice, they're not at odds. Scripture teaches both, and we've got to do justice to both. They are compatible. And they would say that we are free. It says there are sufficient conditions or causes that determine an action, but as long as those conditions or causes do not coerce the agent, the agent is free. And this view accounts for God's sovereignty. The other view does not. This view accounts that we are both moral, responsible agents, but God is in control of all things. And Scripture teaches both. What we cannot do is compromise the character of God. What we cannot do is compromise God's sovereignty. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter that much if we solve the problem of evil. It's not that important. It is all important for us to worship the God of the Bible as he has revealed himself. We don't compromise doctrine. We contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. Christian theology is not subject to revision. So I want to read just several verses that demonstrate that God is totally, exhaustively, meticulously sovereign. And like the last couple of weeks, I want to read a lot because, again, these are verses you don't hear very often. We saw it quite a bit in Jonah, so we won't look in Jonah. The most famous is probably in, in the book of Job. If you've got your Bible, go ahead and turn over to Job. It's before Psalms. If you've got a pew Bible, it's page 370. And you remember the story here in Job chapter 1. If you're new to the Bible, what happens is Job is a righteous man. He's blameless. It tells us that. Extremely blameless, even making sacrifices for his kids for sins they haven't yet committed. That would keep most of us busy. He's blameless, yet the Lord allows Satan to go and he loses everything. He loses all of his house. He loses all of his life. Everything he has, he loses all of his family. And here's what we have in Job chapter 1, verse 20. Here's the response. Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground and worshiped. And he said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Unless the reader, unless someone thinks the reader, well, no, no, that's not really how it happened, Job. The Lord didn't have anything to do with this. He wants to clarify. And in verse 22, he says, in all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. Job is right to say, the Lord is the one who gave, and the Lord is the one who has taken away. Blessed be his name. We see the same thing in the next chapter. Look at Job chapter 2, verse 10. His wife slanders him, and he says, But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God, and shall we not receive evil? And then again, and think we think Job got it wrong. The author tells us right there in verse 10, and all this Job did not sin with his lips. Job falls to the ground and he screams and he credits God and neither of those responses are sin. Flip over to Job chapter 42, very last chapter and keep your finger there. We'll turn back to it here in a little bit. Job chapter 42 verse 2. Job says, I know you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Look at verse 11 of Job 42. Then came to him all his brothers and sisters and all who had known him before and ate bread with him in his house. And they showed him sympathy and comforted him for all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. And each of them gave him a piece of money and a ring of gold. God is sovereign even over the hard stuff. To be sovereign is to be sovereign. Let me read several more. We'll have some of them on the screen if you want to follow along. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 37. 
Who has spoken and it came to pass unless the Lord has commanded it? Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that good and bad come? Psalm 115 verse 3, our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. Proverbs chapter 16 verse 33, the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. He's completely sovereign. Isaiah chapter 14 verse 24, the Lord of hosts has sworn as I have planned, so shall it be. As I have purposed, so shall it stand. Isaiah 45, I am the Lord, there is no other. I form light and I create darkness. Some translations calamity, some translations evil. I make well-being and I create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. Isaiah chapter 46 verse 9. I am God, there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, from ancient times, things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, I will accomplish all my purpose, calling a bird of prey from the east, the man of my counsel from a far country. I have spoken, I will bring it to pass, I have purposed, I will do it. Daniel chapter 4 verse 34, Nebuchadnezzar lifts his eyes to heaven and he says, my reason has returned to me and I bless the most high and praised and honored him who lives forever for his dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. And he does according to his will among the hosts of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth and none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? There's an answer to the problem of evil right there. None will question God and ask him what he has done. Or Ephesians chapter 1 verse 11. Notice here just how comprehensive God's sovereignty is. <clears throat> In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. God is in control. He is absolutely sovereign over all things again even the hard stuff in fact I would say even the most wicked things in the world in fact I was to ask you what is the most wicked thing that has ever happened in the history of the world I would say it's the crucifixion of Jesus Christ the crucifixion of the son of God let me read to you from Acts chapter 2 to see God's plan in that Acts chapter 2 verse 23 this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God you Notice both there. You have God's sovereignty and human responsibility. You, he says, crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. It was God's definite plan that Jesus be killed by the hands of men. They did what ultimately he had, verse 23, predestined to take place. And just in case we didn't believe him, in chapter 2, Luke says it again, just a couple chapters later in chapter 4. Verse 27, for truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. So I'll read all that just to show you that the most popular response, the free will defense, doesn't work because of the Bible. The Bible doesn't teach that view of human freedom. But there's others. There's the free will defense. There's other responses. There's one known as the uh, greater, not the greater good, one that's the, it's a necessary component, basically. Evil is necessary. It's a necessary component of God's world because without evil, we wouldn't know good. Well, that doesn't work because then it would be wrong to try to get rid of evil. We would need evil. We'd like we need the color blue to know the difference between the color red. So that one, to me, at least, is not very satisfying. There's another proposal called the best of all worlds theory, and it's that this is the best way God could have designed it all, including evil. It's just the best God could do. I don't find that very satisfying personally either. Then there's one that's probably close to being the most popular known as the divine weakness defense. Popularized in a book, Eric Kushner named, uh, the book's called When Bad Things Happen to Good People. You've probably at least heard of that book. It basically says God wants to help. He just doesn't have the stuff to make it happen. He's too weak. But the God of Scripture, as we've seen, is sovereign. He is all-wise. He is all-knowing. He is all-powerful. Others say that all suffering and all evil is just a result of our own sin. And that's definitely true of some sins, but not all. We just looked at Job. Job was the righteous sufferer. He was blameless and he suffered. So you can't say it's all a result of 
our own sin. That one doesn't work for me either. The one that I think is most biblically and intellectually and experientially satisfying is known as the greater good defense. Remember the objection. It says that it's logically impossible for God to be both sovereign and good or there would be no evil. Well, the logical problem is solved if we add the following premise. It's logically impossible for God to be both sovereign and good or there would be no evil unless God has a morally sufficient reason for doing so. Add that premise and it's no longer a logical problem. Unless God has a morally sufficient reason and there is a morally sufficient reason, there is a greater good. And skeptics may not like this, but his greater good is his own glory. We're not first and foremost concerned with what people will like or dislike. We're concerned with what God says. And he tells us quite explicitly. So we kind of need to recalibrate ourselves here. The, the problem of evil is a very man-centered objection, isn't it? Because here we are pointing our finger at the divine. How could you, if you really knew what you were doing, or if you were really good according to my limited, finite understanding of what good is, then you wouldn't dot, 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 dot. As the title of one book puts it, we've tried to put God in the dock. And he's God. He doesn't belong in the dock. Human beings don't put him on trial. Biblically speaking, humans don't criticize God or what God does. We don't put him on trial. We don't make him answer to us. He owes us no explanation. Who are we to question him? Maybe you remember the book of Job. Job begins to question him sometime on your own. Go read the last five chapters of Job. Let me flip over there if you still got your finger. Let's look at a couple of those verses and see how God responds when Job begins to question him. Job chapter 38. Verses 1 to 5. Job 38, 1 to 5. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said... Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. I will question you. You make it known to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding who determined its measurements. Surely you know or who stretched the line upon it or on what were its bases sunk or who laid its cornerstone. Flip over a couple pages to Job chapter 40. We have more. Really, the whole five chapters are about it. It gets quite brutal. But in Job chapter 40, and the Lord said to Job, verse 1, Shall a fault finder contend with the Almighty? <laughs> Shall a fault finder contend with the Almighty? He who argues with God, let him answer it. Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am of small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand on my mouth. I've spoken once. I will not answer twice, but I will proceed no further. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, dress for action like a man. I will question you and you make it known to me. Will you even put me in the wrong? Will you condemn me that you may be in the right? He continues and then look again over at chapter 42. Verse 1. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear and I will speak. I will question you and you make it known to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Here's the Old Testament problem of evil. Who are you to question the Almighty? Questions aren't sinful in and of themselves, but when questions take the form of accusations, we should expect a swift rebuke, just like Job received. So the Old Testament answer is found in the book of Job. God is God, and we have the New Testament answer to the problem of evil in Romans chapter 9. Let's turn over there. Again, if you're in your pew Bible, it's page 124. <clears throat> Romans chapter 9, verse 14. 
the most explicit response to the objection of the problem of evil we find. Verse 14 says, what shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? That's the question, right? Is God unjust? Is God not fair? How could he allow evil? Is he unjust? By no means, he says. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose, I have raised you up that I might show my power. Here's the greater good that I might show my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills and he hardens whomever he wills. Do you remember the story of Pharaoh? Do you remember how much suffering and even evil came about because of the rule of Pharaoh? Here God tells us why he raised up Pharaoh. To show his power for his own glory. So that his name might be proclaimed in all the earth. This is the fundamental concern of the Almighty in Scripture. It's not us. It's him. In the book of Ezekiel alone, this little phrase, know that I am the Lord, that you might know that I am the Lord, happened 72 times. Basically, everything God does in the book of Ezekiel is so that we would know he is the Lord. Or notice just these little repeated phrases in, in the book of Isaiah chapter 48. For my name's sake... For the sake of my praise, for my own sake, for my own sake I do it. How should my name be profaned? I will not give my glory to another. God does all that he does, first and foremost, for his own glory. This is why Jonathan Edwards put it this way. We see that the great end of God's works, which are so variously expressed in Scripture, is indeed but one. And this one end is most properly and comprehensively called the glory of God. It is what the scripture is about, and it is the greater good. Let's keep reading, though, in Romans 9. Look at verse 19. Will you say to me then, this sounds kind of like Job, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? If he's totally sovereign, how can he blame me? How can I resist his will? Verse 20, here's the New Testament answer to the problem of evil. Who are you, O man? To answer back to God, will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God desiring to show his wrath, here's the greater good. What if God desiring to show his wrath and make known his power has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy which he has prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he's called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. So when people dismiss Christianity or object to God, the response they get biblically is, who are you? Oh, man. Here's your theodicy. Here's your defense. It reminds me of what King Jesus says in the parable of the laborers in the vineyard. He says, am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? It's where we need to be recalibrated a little bit. We need to kind of fall back on our backs and realize who we are and who he is. The greater good is the glory of God. But in the wonderful world that God has designed, that's not all. Not only his glory, but our good. Our good. The greater good is not only his glory, but it is our good. I wonder if you guys, anyone use catechisms? If not, let me encourage you to begin to catechize. It's a historic Christian practice among all traditions. It's not just a Catholic thing. We've actually, in the book table over here in our Welcome Center, we've got several. We've got a bigger uh, devotional one, and then we've got these little bitty white, and it's called the New City Catechism. There's also a free app, New City Catechism. Let me encourage you to grab one. They're a dollar over there at the book table and start using them with your children, especially for you parents. But even for adults, it's good to have been catechized with doctrine. And I love the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Don't agree with everything in there, but I love it. And the first question in the Westminster Shorter Catechism is, what is the chief end of man? And the answer is man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Those two purposes, those two ends are not at odds. 
glorify God and enjoy, not just obey, not just dutifully follow, but enjoy him. They actually go together. John Piper, if you're familiar with him, has spent most of his ministry trying to show just that. And when I was in college, there was a book called Desiring God that was going around like hotcakes, and it changed a lot of people's lives. College students, let me just encourage you, grab that book, John Piper, Desiring God. Adults, do the same. And here's his basic premise, that God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. Those two great ends are not at odd. God wants his glory. We've seen just a hint of that, and we want joy, don't we? Doesn't everyone in here want joy? Well, we find our deepest joy when we glorify God. And so God wants us not just to follow him. He wants us to joyfully follow him. And so it's a win-win situation. God's get his glory. We get our joy. That's what we were made for. It's where true joy is found, created for his glory. We find our joy when we do what we were created for. Isaiah 43, 7, God created his people for my glory, whom I formed and whom I made. So the greater good, the morally sufficient reason is the glory of God and our own good. That's why evil is in this world. God has a greater purpose. Turn over to Romans. If you still got your book and your your Bible open to Romans chapter 9, just flip back a page to Romans 8. Romans 8, 28. I hope you all know this verse. I hope it's in your lifeblood. This, This is where I stay. Like a fat kid in freeze tag, this is my home base. (laughs) I'm not leaving. Look at Romans 8, 28. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. Notice right there that there is not a greater good for everybody. There's only a greater good for those who love God. There's only a greater good for those who are called according to his purpose. And what is the good? God is working all things. Again, that's a piece of who he is. He's sovereign. He's working all things, not some, not not just the things that he has the power to work through. No, all things, and he's working them for our good. But it is very important for us to define good the way God defines good. Let's keep reading. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. The good is being conformed to the image of Jesus. God is working all things together for the good of those who love him, for those who are called according to his purpose. What is the good? That we might be conformed to the image of his son, that we might become more like Jesus, that we might grow spiritually, grow in holiness. That is the good. That is our ultimate good. God's at work, and he's at work for his glory and for our sanctification. This is good news, and we see it everywhere in Scripture. Probably the best illustration of Romans 8, 28 in the Old Testament is the story of Joseph. Remember the story of Joseph, one of 12, betrayed, sold, ends up being raised up by the Lord, and has authority over all of Egypt, and his brothers have a famine, and they come to him because he is the one that will have decisions And they come and they realize it's him and they're so sorry, probably scared of the life. And you remember what he says? This is Genesis 50, verse 20. If you're a Bible marker, maybe write Genesis 50, 20, right by Romans 8, 28. Because there, Joseph tells the brothers that were wicked. It was evil. And he tells them what you meant for evil, God meant, same verb, for good. What you and your purposes and your wicked heart meant for evil, God meant through those same actions for good. God works through all things for our good and for his glory. And isn't it usually in the hard things that we are most conformed to Christ? It's the painful truth of the Christian life is we go deepest when the cross is heaviest. C.S. Lewis, God whispers in our pleasures, but he shouts in our pain. And most of us can see that, can't we? Most of us can see that we went deep with the Lord when things were rough. And most of us who've experienced trial can already see how God was at work through various trials. 
Why couldn't it be possible that God knows there are good reasons for all of them, even if we never see? Again, C.S. Lewis, quote, they say some temporal suffering, they say of some temporal suffering, no future bliss could make up for it. Not knowing that heaven once attained will work backwards and turn even that agony into glory. It's the pattern of the Christian life. We've seen it quite a bit in my short tenure here through 1 Peter and through Jonah. I love the way John Newton puts it. John Newton has helped me tremendously with the theology of suffering. And he summarizes Romans 8, 28 this way. He says, all shall work together for good. Everything needful that he sends. Nothing can be needful that he withholds. This is a really good summary of the scripture we've just looked at. Just imagine if we owned that. All will work together for good. Everything is not only optional, it's needful. He knows best. He knows better than we do. Everything needful that he sends, nothing can be needful that he withholds. Oh, this would be so freeing, church, if we believed it. Again, he says this, Newton says this, the supreme disposer of all that concerns us that he numbers the very hairs of our heads. He appoints every trial we meet with in number, weight, and measure and will suffer nothing to befall us but what shall contribute to our good. This view, I say, is medicine suited to the disease and powerfully reconciles us unto every cross. Oh, if we believed it, right? If we believed it, because then the hardest parts of our lives can be flipped and are actually the best part of our lives because we know we have a God who is for us, working for his glory and for our good. We ought to be able to suffer well and we ought to suffer differently than the world because we have a hope. We understand God is good. We know he's for us. We know he's at work. This isn't the enemy. This isn't just my sin. It may be both of those, but behind those are a God who's working through those to make me more like Jesus. We ought to be the most joyful people. That's why all over the Bible we're called to rejoice in trials. Count it all joy, brothers. James 1, this is one of the main themes of Scripture. I love the way Jonathan Edwards, but Jonathan Edwards was 18, not a perfect pastor. He owned slaves, for example, but he had a bright mind. And at 18, we have his earliest sermon. It may have been his earliest sermon ever. We have it, and it's a very simple sermon. And it just says that Christians ought to be the happiest of all people, regardless of outward circumstances. Christians ought to be the joyful of all people. And the reasons are threefold, he gives us. Number one, all things are working together for good. We've seen that. Even the bad things, when trials come, it will work together for good. That's Romans 8, 28. Number two, our good things, gospel glories, being declared in the right, having our sins forgiven, being a child of God, being united to Christ, our good things cannot be taken away. If you're in Christ, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Your bad things are working for good. Your good things cannot be taken away. And then number three, our best things, life with God, eternal joy, resurrection life is yet to come. And so he says Christians ought to be the happiest of all people. He says the godly man is happy in whatsoever world circumstances he is placed. We'll say a lot more about a theology of suffering next week, but I want us to close out thinking of the fact that atheists, who usually are the ones making this objection, have a problem of evil as well. Oftentimes we get backed into a corner at Christians. We need to become a lot better of asking questions and then being a good listener after we ask. We tend to just get backed into the corner and we ought to be asking, hey, what do you think about or how do you respond to and just begin asking questions and let the spirit work through them as they think about the bankruptcy of their own views like this one every worldview must deal with evil and i truly believe that evil is actually a greater problem for atheism than it is for christianity remember in the sermon on science i talked about evolution has no basis to say anything is good or bad wicked or good Everything just is, according to the evolutionary worldview. Just time plus chance acting on matter. There is no spirit, it's just body. 
There is no thoughts, just gray matter in the physical brain. There's nothing beyond the physical world. So there's no way to say anything is good or evil. Opinions about good and evil, they're just opinions. And opinions are really not opinions. They're really not thoughts. It's just neurochemistry in the brain. The matter in your brain makes you think that you think certain things are good or evil. And it may be different for another person. Remember, if I took a Dr. Pepper and a Mountain Dew and I shook them up, I wouldn't say one is evil and one is good. They just are. One fizzes one way and another fizzes another way. That's what naturalism teaches. So the issue of the problem of evil becomes evil? No problem. There is no evil. So atheists have no basis to call anything good or evil. We can't allow them just to assume such categories. They must prove it according to their own view. But most of them say, all right, you're right, I can't just say it's my opinion. And so there's two main ways that atheists try to ground morality and found the basis between good and evil. One of those is in culture. They say, well, it's just up to individual cultures. Cultures decide what's wrong and what's right. But that doesn't work. That is not livable. It might have been livable when we only knew our own culture and couldn't speak to other cultures. But now we know we can take, for example, uh, ISIS. According to the culture of ISIS, it is righteous to kill the infidels like you and I. According to their culture, that is a good thing. Or what about Nazi Germany? According to that culture, the majority believed what they were doing was right. Do we have any basis to say one culture is better than another culture? One culture is more evil than another culture. And as soon as you do that, all of a sudden you're raising a standard outside of culture, which they cannot do. And I mentioned in that sermon there, there would be no room for the moral reformer that goes against culture because cultures become wicked, like Desmond Tutu or like Martin Luther King Jr. or like William Wilberforce. Atheism would say, no, you just need to sit down and be quiet because the culture has determined what is right or wrong. It doesn't work. It's not livable to say it's just based on culture. Others say that morality, the ability to determine and distinguish good from evil, is based on science. But science has no ability to prescribe, only describe. There are no oughts in science, only is and again according to evolution survival of the fittest is king and that tends to get bloody have you ever seen planet earth (laughs) the difference between the animals and humans driven by violence strong eat the weak the whole worldview is built on what we call evil natural selection is evil strong eat the weak even among humans because according to them we're no different And most thankfully agree. They don't live consistently with their worldview, but this is where we need to press and say, wait a minute, why do you call that evil? On what basis do you say that is good? And there are some consistent atheists, like there's a guy named Steven Pinker. He's an ethics professor, professor of morality at Princeton University. It's amazing how far we've come. Princeton University began as a Calvinistic seminary to train pastors And now Steven Pinker will often say things that are just off the wall. Here's the thing I like about Steven Pinker is he's consistent with his worldview. So several years back, uh, maybe you remember the whole issue of the prom baby. You remember that? It was a high school girl. She was pregnant and she was at prom, very pregnant. She goes to the bathroom, delivers the baby, discards it after ending its life, goes back out to the dance floor and dances with her friends. I think most people call that evil. Steven Pinker said, oh, no, that's totally normal and totally natural. In fact, we ought to be more understanding. Let me quote from his article in the New York Times. He says, infanticide is totally natural. We should understand her actions. She was living like a consistent product of natural selection. Quote, if a newborn is sickly or if its survival is not promising, they may cut their losses, end quote. Remember, survival of the fittest. And according to this woman, this baby would draw me back, keep me from flourishing. And so it's totally natural to cut my losses and continue on with what my life is supposed to be about according to her. He's being consistent, but that's what most of us would call wicked. Science cannot ground morality quite the opposite. And on their basis, it's a, it's a weird objection, right? Because we only know a God who is good and a God who is powerful from the scripture which they object. 
They object to the God of Scripture based on a certain sense of rightness and justice and goodness that their own worldview cannot account for. This is one of the reasons C.S. Lewis became a Christian. Let me read what he says. He says, my argument against God was that the universe seemed so cruel and unjust, the problem of evil. But how had I got this idea of just and unjust? What was I comparing this universe with when I called it unjust? Of course, I could have given up my idea of justice by saying it was nothing but a private idea of my own. But if I did that, then my argument against God collapsed too. For the argument depended on saying that the world was really unjust, not simply that it did not happen to please my private fancies. Consequently, atheism turns out to be too simple. And it is. Moral standards presuppose an objective moral standard. To say anything is good or evil, we need something outside of ourselves, an absolute moral standard. And we have that. It is the nature and character and will of God. He has given us that. And the heart of Christianity is the gospel. It's the good news, which presupposes bad news. And the bad news is none of us meet that standard. We fall short, which is why here at Southside, we cannot get over the gospel of Jesus Christ. We know his standard and we know we don't meet up. We know we have sinned against him. We know we have rebelled. And so we flee to Christ for forgiveness. Maybe that's you. Maybe you are here and you don't know the Lord. Let me urge you to trust in Christ. You can do that today, right where you are. You just give your life to him. Trust in him and begin to follow him all your days. So it's not the case that one can look and say, okay, the problem of evil, Christianity's wrong. That's way too simple. Rather, all have a problem of evil. And the question becomes, which way of viewing and living in the world is most intellectually and experientially satisfying? And I think the Christian faith provides unique among worldviews, unique resources for dealing with suffering. Again, next week we'll spend the whole time. But what we've already seen, we've already seen that he is powerful and he is sovereign and he is good and he's working all things for our good. But what else in the Christian worldview do we see? We have the doctrines of creation. God created the world and he created it good. We have the doctrines of sin, the doctrine of fall. It was created good. There was to be no suffering or evil. Sin brought that about. Then we have the doctrines of incarnation and atonement. The God of Christianity is not distant. He's not disinterested. God himself entered human history. He experienced betrayal, injustice, and a gruesome death. Jesus was a man of suffering. He was familiar with pain. World's hard, not all is well, but we have a God who entered in, a God who is with us. And then Christianity is the only religion where God entered human history and experienced the worst of human suffering and evil and rejection and pain. He endured suffering so that one day he could rid the world of it. The doctrine of resurrection and the renewal of all things, God will undo all wrong. He will make all things right one day. He will finally and ultimately and definitively triumph over evil. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus.